vient d'arriver dans notre unité FMB sur le campus de l'Uni. Donc pour créer une nouvelle équipe à type dans le cadre du programme à type à venir et soutenu aussi par la formation des parcours chulaires. Euh, donc brièvement... Je suis en train de Et donc brièvement, Juan, ben, il a toujours été dans le monde des virus, hein, depuis, sa, depuis sa thèse à Madrid, euh, jusqu'à un long post euh, stage postdoctoral aussi euh, à Madrid, avant de rejoindre l'unité de Stéphane Cusac le MBM, où là, sous la forme d'une grosse postdoctorale à mot, et aussi ensuite intégrant le, le staff de MBM. Et voilà, et depuis donc le euh, juin, il, il est arrivé chez nous pour créer une nouvelle équipe. Voilà. Merci. Euh, oui, en effet, je vais faire le séminaire en anglais, si ça ne me pas. Uh, it's, as if I was saying, no, 15 years I've been working on biology. And I've been touching different viruses and different aspects of biology, for instance, biochemistry, uh, cell infection, uh, and the structure of biology. What I've never touched, and that's why I'm very happy to be here, is the medical part of biology. And uh, actually, at the very end of, my, of the last seven years, I've been working at the ABL in, in Grenoble, and I've been focused on negative stranded virus and, and taking as a model Wundia virus in order to understand transcription and replication. So, viruses are classified depending on their genome. So, if they have a DNA genome or an RNA genome, if the RNA is double stranded or single stranded, or positive stranded or negative stranded. So, and these have very deep biological implications, okay? So for instance, negative strand RNA virus are single stranded RNA virus, and their genome sequence is complementary to the messenger RNA. What does it mean? That the first thing a virus have to do when infecting the cell is to transcribe the RNA. <coughs> and for this, the virus needs to carry all the replication and transcription machinery from one cell to another in the viral particle. So you have many pathogenic viruses in this group. You may recognize some of them. So, for instance, you have Ebola virus, uh, you have rabies virus, uh, measles virus, and other uh, like influenza or, or Lassa virus are highly pathogenic. And this group of viruses is divided actually in two. Those who have a single RNA molecule as a genome, a big RNA molecule, so we have rabies and Ilo, uh, and they have an RNA dependent RNA polymerase that have to carry from one cell to another. Uh, with, the, with the genome. And these polymers are multifunctional and are able to cap the RNA in order to perform transcription. Okay. And they work in these linear ribonucleoproteins, which are a complex of RNA with nucleoprotein and polymerase. So we have, on another hand, another group which are segmented negative standard viruses that are like before, but they have the, the genome segmented in several pieces. So it can be two for a rhinovirus can be three for Punya or eight for Orco. That, that is the case for influenza, for instance. Okay, and each of these fragments has these assemblies of the nucleoprotein with the nucleoprotein and the polymerase. Okay? The RNA-dependent RNA polymerases here are very special because they do transcription in a very unique way, which is called gap snatching, which is a smart way by which the virus is able to recognize the messenger RNAs with a gap-binding activity. And then with an the endonuclease is giving this mRNA and this little stretch with the cap structure serves for the initiation of transcription. Okay, this cap snatching. And another another feature is that I have the three prime extreme and the five prime extreme. So the ends of the of the RNA, they are complementary. So they can do a duplex. And this was thought actually was the reason why these viruses have the ripple nuclear process of circular, as I will show you now. So these are ribonucleoproteins from like Rosartomunia virus, and this is a ribonucleoprotein of uh, influenza virus. So you can see here this circular, this is electron microscopy, okay? You can see here the genome and these circular structures that in influenza are, are twisted. So it's like a double helix. It's like a circle that you twist, and then it's the double helix. And you can see here, da 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 da, and then there's a loop and go down, okay? And this circular, actually, I'm going to focus on orthotomia viruses which are simple because have only three segments instead of the eight segments of influenza. And they thought and they, these three segments are the small segment, the medium segment, and the large segment, coding for all the proteins these virus have. So I want to focus on this S segment that 
codes for the nuclear protein, and this with very big L segment that goes for the big L <coughs> protein, which is the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Okay? These two proteins, plus the RNA, are making these kind of circular structures. Uh, you see the RNA coded by the nuclear protein and the L protein bound. And so these are the actual units of replication and transcription in these viruses. So what they do are able to transcribe and synthesize the mRNA from the genomic negative standard viral RNA, and they can do replication through a complementary positive standard RNA. Okay. And all this is happening in these structures. And so this is the end of this genome. That you can see that are highly complementary. You see, for all the and in all the families in all species. So A U G C U K. Okay, complementary. What happened? is that actually several biochemical studies have been done in order to see what's the relevance of this complementarity. And actually what they figure out in the independent studies is that this red part is actually important in the sequence, but not in the complementarity. And that this other green part is important on the complementarity, but not the sequence. So something strange is going on there. Okay? And actually traditionally, from the 70s, 80s, this was thought was the reason why these were circular structures, because of this complementarity at the end. Okay. And so my work at the NBL started here. We wanted to know structurally how these structures work and give mechanisms in order to understand uh, where we can touch at this, uh, this replication for therapeutic reasons. So the first thing we, do, we did uh, was to solve the structure of the nuclear protein alone and in complex with the RNA in order to see how these circular nuclear, protein, circular nuclear proteins are inside the, at the atomic level. So we get the structure of this nuclear protein, you see it's a very small protein with arms, with two arms that are very flexible. You can see the protein core and the flexible arms in different crystal cores of God. So this nuclear protein is able to bind the RNA, twisting the RNA. This is another structure with the RNA in. Okay, so in somehow it's able to compact the RNA inside this small protein. And then the very long RNA molecules, uh, we, we have this structure of this helical uh, form, and uh, this was telling us how this nuclear protein is actually able to code all these large uh, RNA molecules. And so we could figure out actually what was the position, the relative position of the nuclear protein. For instance, the N terminus of the nuclear protein, which is this one, was corresponding to the 5' prime of the RNA and the C terminus to the 3' prime. So we had an image, an atomic resolution image, of how this uh, ribonuclear protein was. But we also figure out the extreme flexibility this nuclear protein has. So this is allowing, actually, to the ribonuclear protein to be very flexible, as we can see uh, in the structures of the ribonuclear protein by electron microscopy. You see that this is very, very chaotic, no? But some stretches, you see this alien stretch. So it's corresponding on size and on distances to what we find in the crystal. So it's a link. We can really link what is going on in the, in the virus with an atomic resolution structure. So you can read more in, in, in this paper regarding the NIH 2013. But the main role player here is the polymerase, is this multifunctional polymerase. And actually, so here we have two examples. The lacrosse, which is a punja virus, is my model of, of study, and influenza. So influenza has a trimerase polymerase, and this lacrosse has a monomeric polymerase, like all punja virus and arena viruses. And so they have, uh, we have a lot of information about influenza because it's a very studied system. And uh, several domains have been isolated from this polymerase, like uh, uh, this gap snatching endonuclease, which is actually fluid performing gap snatching. This gap binding uh, protein, which uh, I was speaking about the gap snatching before, and uh, but no information about the big polymerase. Some some pieces isolated with unknown function. Okay, and we knew nothing on polymerase. <coughs> so we started by isolating this endonuclease, that is homologous. And then we started to realize that maybe this, even if it's trimeric and monomeric, these polymerases have the same kind of structure. Because you can see that in the middle, they have the six conserved polymerase motifs. And then in the middle terminus, they have uh, this uh, endonuclease, which is very important for the transcription. So this is the answer I'm going to try, we are, I'm going to uh, get at the end of the talk. Uh, so the strategy we, we decided to, to, to take for this polymerase was actually first to get meaningful protein constructs in order to express this protein homogeneously and to be able to analyze it biochemically and structurally. 
So this, for instance, is a skin. This is the full protein and, and protein digestion we did, and then we decided to, to we design a number of constructs. So at the end, from all these constructs, one of them, with a C-terminal division, was so stable, was so easy to work with. And then what we, the first thing we want to know about the proteins is how do they interact with the other partners of the other molecular protein. So we tried with the nuclear protein, and there was no interaction with the nuclear protein. And then we tried with the RNA promoter in this form, and this is what happened. So this is an experiment of anisotropy, by which you can see the binding of a protein to a fluorescent label molecule, in this case, RNA, OK? So we have the fluorescent RNA, this RNA, fluorescent label. And then we add increasing amounts of protein, and we see how the anisotropy changes. And like this, we can calculate the affinity. And what we have found is that this promoter that was supposed to bind the polymerase was actually binding with very, very low affinity, almost none. So the micromolar rings mean, means no affinity. But if isolating only one of the two pieces, the three prime in this case, was giving much more uh, affinity. And actually, doing more accurate experiments, we could realize that actually the five prime and the three prime RNAs are interacting with the polymerase independently. So, and this was very striking because for years it was thought this was making a panhandle and this was the kind of natural being of this RNA in nature, but was not active, was not interacting with the polymerase. So, to figure out a bit more what was going on, what we did is this RNA will shorten the five prime. So, we were letting free the three prime, you see? Uh, shortening, 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 shortening. And this is an experiment of uh, gel strip tache. In order to see, it's a different experiment, but we also see the interaction with the RNA, okay? And we figure out that if we shorten enough the five prime, so letting like nine nucleotides single stranded, then the protein pump was binding. And was binding even stronger than the RNA alone. And so this was essential for the next steps that was to try to get crystals. So, Meaning, biologically meaningful crystals of this system. So what we did is protein purified, high amounts. We characterized the protein, this is an electron microscope, you see is homogeneous. Then in combination with the RNA we saw was binding, we could set different crystal forms. <coughs> we get these crystal forms, which are stable proteins ordered in the space. And like this, we can get the crystallographic structure, atomic resolution structure of proteins from protein components. And we do it in a synchrotron, which is giving this kind of data, okay? That then we compute and finally solve the structure. And now I'm gonna present you the structure coming up from this. Another property of the crystals is that you can actually add things, like interactors, you can add oral RNAs, inhibitors, and you can see the interaction with the crystal. This is very nice. It's called soaking, okay? And so what we did was to crystal it like this and then to soak the five prime RNA that is also binding the polymerase. And we got this, the following structure. So it's very complex because it's very big. But here you have a scheme, and, uh, and I'm going to try to do this video to, to explain you how from a normal polymerase you can build up a big polymerase uh, like the ninja virus. What you have here is the right-handed right polymeric structure. So here you have the subdomain, the thumb, the palm, and the fingers, okay? As any polymerase in, in, in life. So what happened in polymerase the is that they put several insertions, no, in the fingers, for instance, and this, for instance, for, to control the access to the polymerase, and this to bind in RNA. And then there is this part here that is actually increasing the size of the polymerase, and this getting this, this thumb away. So for instance, if you compare with poliovirus, this thumb is here and it's moved there. So expanding somehow the polymerase. So if we remove this poliovirus again, I can show you that this place here, this cplc like domain, have also several insertions that are also biologically very, very relevant. Then something will happen that all this part is also buttressing the polymerase around and somehow closing the access to the polymerase and making it more robust. So you have this part here, and then this, this thumb ring that is stabilizing the, the thumb in this uh, displaced position. Now. And actually, if you, then this is the core of the protein, and then you have this hanging domain, which is the end of the base, which is hanging, hanging from, the, from the core, and it's linked, but it's linked here. 
So you can see this linker here. And uh, this linker is buttressing us again the polymerase and positioning the endonuclease in the exact place where it's needed. And I'll tell you why. So we could also see the RNAs binding here to 5 prime RNA. You can see it very, very nicely, but the 3 prime RNA that are near the entrance of, to the polymerase. Okay? And you can see the binding of the template of the genome is in one side and the endonuclease is in another side. It's like a compartmentalization of the reading of the genome, so I read the genome here, and I'm processing the genome there. So I don't interfere, I don't cleave, for instance, the genome, I cleave uh, the messenger RNA. You know, this, this compartmentalization is very important to understand this polymerase. So, another striking thing was when we could compare this structure with influenza. So, this is across the same scheme I was showing you before, with all the different domains. And this is the scheme this, of the structural influence of polymerase. So you can see that there is the same pattern, there is the same overall architecture. And these viruses, even if completely, is very distant from segmented negative standard viruses, maintain this configuration. So this means that these mechanisms are conserved uh, in all the families and all these pathogenic viruses. So for instance, here we split the structure in three because the influenza polymerase is split in three. So we have PA, and you can see this uh, extension I was telling you uh, before, which is the same or very similar. And the endonuclease in this case is here, here is in another position, but this is flexible, remember, so uh, it can be two different states. Then the central part, we have here the, the right hand again, uh, and you can see that the insertions are changing. So influenza, what the, this is the, the features that are changing are, for instance, this alpha ribbon that is giving access to the polymerase, because they have to interact with nuclear proteins that are also different, and they have to respond to different environments in the cell, in the cell infection. And, uh, and you have this part here, which is buttressing the stem, which is also very similar. So you can see that all these polymerases are, are, have a common ancestor and that uh, are very, very similar, which was striking because half absolutely no sequence conservation. Actually, because are so similar, and now we have two structures we can recognize new motifs that may have essential role, uh, role simply in the polymerization of the RNA. So, and now we can start uh, analyzing this. This, for instance, a motif G and a motif H that we described are conserved, not only in Puya virus and influenza, but in all uh, the negative segmented negative standard virus. And we can start studying these polymerases in a different way, with much more insight. And we also did electromicroscopy. I don't know if you know a little bit the difference between electromicroscopy and, uh, and crystallography. But electromicroscopy allows you to see different, uh, to, to split the polymerase structures in different substructures you find in the, in the sample. And so you can see a certain flexibility. Here, for instance, you have the resolution is going from 6 astrons to 10 astrons. And this is meaning flexibility. So you can see which are the flexible parts and this flexibility is, is very important for the function of the proteins. Okay, because if, if the protein is flexible, it's alive somehow. And uh, you can see this part here, that, that is very flexible, which is the clamp, you can see now, and the endonuclease that is very flexible, so in some classes there is not there, here is there. Uh, it's very nice and complementary to have both kinds of structures. Okay. So, and we could see how the polymerase is binding with the RNA. So the 3 prime RNA is actually the template is the first thing that got rid of, you know? And the virus, in order to replicate and transcribe its own genome, needs to specifically recognize this RNA. But this is not very known how it happens in nature for many, many viral systems. So here, what we saw is that the RNA is actually found in binding in this, in this pocket that is clamped by this structure. And this structure is the one that was flexible in the, in the previous structure. <coughs> the previous structure in electron microscopy has no RNA. So, this is honey, this is a, a flexible clamp, and then when recognizing the RNA clamp, is uh, is making it very stably bound to the, to the polymerase. And now, uh, doing we can mutate this RNA and see if it's still binding. And we can see that C5, A6, and C7, A8, so this stretch is very specific for the interaction, no? and not really the others. And we found out something very astonishing, which is that the interaction of the five prime, so the other end of the, of the genome, was actually allosterically regulating the active side of the polymerase. So here you have the five prime uh, bound to the polymerase. And you see this alpha helix, when the RNA is not there, it's this green. And then when the RNA is there, it's becoming the blue. And so there's a little shift. 
Okay, it's like a gear when you are driving. And what happens is that this part, which is an essential motive for the catalytic function of the polymer, the motive F, gets ordered. So I'm going to show you how does it look from the crystal data. Oh. So this is with a VRA, okay? So the density that you see for this loop, that is motive F, is, is in blue, in the blue net. So when the five prime, you saw the five prime, bam, all of these get ordered in crystal. So you start to see it, and it's in the active conformation. So it's like a, uh, a switch, inactive, active, inactive, active. And this is used by the virus in order to regulate and coordinate the replication cycles. No? I'm very striking as well. This also is the same what you find in influenza. In influenza, you have the same kind of structure with these histidines are interacting with the pulse of the RNA. And this is therefore a mechanism of regulation of the activity that is conserved in all segmented neural extended viruses like Lassa, Influenza, and many other human pathways. Another striking thing was looking inside. So this polymerase is very big. And what happens is that the access is, is very controlled. So normally the polymerase is put in the RNA and is given double standard RNA as a result, or double, or double standard DNA, not for DNA polymerases. So what happened here is that what we found is that there is an internal chamber, okay, and then four different paths of entry. So in one, the entities are getting in, and in other, the template is getting in into the active sites. So here is starting the reaction, the polymerization. And then you have a double standard RNA, but then normally in other polymerases, this double standard RNA goes out and that's it. But in this polymerase, there are two channels, and actually it's obliged to split into two. And that is why, and that is how, this RNA virus maintain their RNA genome, a single strand. So you can see. Huh? And interestingly, the product exit is aside the end of the place, which is the processing, uh, the processing mechanism. And again, this is conserved in all negative standard viruses, and this is even conserved in the in double standard RNA viruses. And this was very, very striking. So each person have two beta replicates, which is an unrelated double standard RNA virus. So they have the same kind of chamber, they the closed chamber, okay? And so you can see here this is lacrosse, and this is a two beta. One side you have the identity entry. So if you turn 90 degrees, you have the template entry and the template exit. And then in the other side, in the back, you have the product exit. No? So the same scheme in the standard RNA viruses. So this is probably a mechanism that is more more uh, extended that we that we could even imagine at the beginning. And most importantly, this all this information can get integrated in, into a model of replication. So you can start to understand all the steps the replication, this virus needs to, to accomplish the replication. So the structure we have is this one, okay? So we have the RNA, 5' RNA on one side, the 3' RNA on one side. We know that these guys have to double strand here in this part of the, of the biochemical uh, experiment I was telling you at the beginning. So this is a kind of pre-initiation step. It's inactive, okay, the polymerase. So what the first thing the polymerase need to do is to put the 3' into the active side through the, the, the entry channel, okay? And this will be a very, important part of the replication because this will approximate the 5' prime and the 3' prime that are caused by nuclear protein and this will allow the circularization, so the maturation of the RNA. And maybe this double standard RNA is, is, is important for this, for getting the mature RNA there. And then, following, the machine starts to work and start to synthesize RNA and so it's starting to pull the template, which is here in green red, and this can happen in a mechanism that is called the prime, uh, there's a lot of information I know, uh, prime realign mechanism, by which the, the repeated sequence are once and again uh, synthesized, so you have these repeating, repeating sequences just because the template is going back and forward. Okay? And this could be actually big cause, cause because of this stable double standard RNA, so it's not letting the RNA go, and it's provoking this, this kind of movement. No? And this actually you can see, particularly in hantavirus. And then the, after the initiation happens, no, so the, the polymerase is able to, to go around and, uh, and actually synthesize the, the whole genome. Yeah. Uh, and actually can go, can go uh, 
synthesizing the whole genome. So the, thing, the fact that they have the template entry and exit very, very close one to each other allows that then read the RNA without disassembling the whole regular protein. So the RNA is always stable eh? and accessible at the same time. And then finally, there's another aspect. So in the processing, in the replication, what needs to happen, the RNA that is coming out needs to be coated again into ribbon to protein because this is the function of the, the ribbon to protein. So another polymerase will come in, and the nuclear protein, new nuclear protein will be coating this. And this should be something coordinated, something a coordinated process. So uh, the concentration of nuclear proteins, the concentration of polymerase in the cell matters. And finally, the virus has this smart way in order to avoid that the two strands get together double strand and then they are completely useless. So which is that uh, when the five prime RNA is still in the cavity, so the three prime RNA can go and bump and bump and bind specifically the binding side. And then the five prime RNA is coming out and is binding this way. So in, in, in this way the virus avoids uh, that, that the two strands get together and then are not recognizable anymore by the polymerase. So all these insights. Well, you can find more information in, in, in this paper. Uh, actually, changed the way people think of Bunja virus right now on the replication and transcription. And this is actually, I, I was speaking about replication, but there is also transcription, the caption action. And this is much better, much better study in influenza. So you can see this is the same kind of polymerase, and you have an endonuclease and a cap binding So this was the process that now we have. Uh, in Stephen group, there's a group, and all they have uh, characterized at the atomic level. So you have the cap binding domain that is recognizing the RNA, and then is offering the RNA to the endonuclease that is cleaving. And actually, this distance we find in the, they find in the crystals are corresponding to the number of nucleotides that you find in nature. Yeah, 50 nucleotides. That's a mystery. Can be a little bit more or less. And then the endonuclease, the, the the cap binding domain is able to redirect the, this stretch of RNA and to the active site and initiate the, the transcription, which is an amazing description of how this process works at the atomic level. But there was an error because in this, in this uh, paper they didn't figure out about the four channels and the cavity, so the RNA, the template is coming in the right, in the wrong direction, should be coming here. And, uh, and like this, they synthesize the the RNA. So this kind of insight for Bunya virus is what the next thing to seek for. So we want to do how we want to see how this process works in Bunya virus. If it's the same, if it's different, and if some other cellular factors have been are actually regulating this as well, are taking this part. For instance, transcription is coupled to translation for Bunya virus. So maybe ribosomes have something to do here as well. And this work was done in this Bunya team, uh, which will work me and PhD student with Stephen Cusack that was uh, getting the money and showing up from time to time, and then uh, Helen Mallet that was doing the electron microscopy. Uh, many people that has been uh, in the lab only do it for working on this project, and uh, a lot of people that help, particularly at the SRF, there are fantastic people scientists that uh, help you with this uh, very difficult techniques sometimes. But now I'm here at the FMD, and I'm going to change the project. So um, I'm going to work, I will work about, uh, with uh, chikungunya and alpha virus, and I want again to see how this virus is transcribed and replicated. And this is a challenge, a new challenge, because not much is known in an integrative way, as I was showing you before, uh, for the virus. These are our calls, <coughs> of course, a global health threat, uh, transmitted by mosquitoes, our human exchange is actually making this virus expand uh, quite dramatically. So I'm going to briefly, this is going to be just a brief description of what I'm going to do in the next year. Okay? So this is the structure of the polymer, which is also multifunctional. I have four, four units, no? and this gets proteolytically cleaved, cleaved, so it's different. Okay? It's different. Uh, but what is interesting is that many, this is a positive standard virus, and many positive standard virus have the same kind of, like before I was showing you, the same kind of Organization. So you have to have the RNA dependent RNA polymerase in one side and in the other the capital machinery. So I believe that somehow certain mechanisms and structures will be conserved among these, in theory, unrelated viruses. Okay. And actually, this is an explanation of how this replication complex works. And this is amazing. So uh, these, these viruses, 
basically what they do first is to synthesize partially the replication publish only the third first two units. And these get cleaved, and then they go to different parts of the cell, and they do it in different things, in the stress granules, nucleus, membrane. And one of the things they do is that they provoke the right zone to go through a stop column, so it's able to synthesize the full replication complex. But then it gets partially cleaved. And apparently this is important in order to recognize the genomic RNA, the, which is also, and it's like a messenger RNA actually, and it's recognizing it and synthesizing the complementary RNA, and finally, the replication complex is fully processed and now can recognize the complementary RNA and transcribe the genomic RNA, subgenomic RNA. So the same replication complex is doing different things in different circumstances. And what I really want to know is how this structurally uh, can be explained. I propose a model that I believe is not going to be valid only for alpha viruses but also for other standard viruses. And for this, uh, I, we are setting up a new character special facility in place, so now we have only one of these modules. We can express protein in insect cells and in mammalian cells, and these are actually the, the, the natural hosts of these viruses, so I really believe we are going to manage to express this. And we have uh, the newest methods for the newest are not very new, but are very good. And this uh, multi vac system, so with bacular virus, we are able to express these proteins by infecting. Uh, back with the back insect cells with the bacular virus that express our protein, okay? And so at the end, uh, we have already have some of the proteins expressed, so you can see here, one day after the infection takes over, we call it cell arrest, you have some protein expression. So the facility, even if we started three months ago, is already running, and it's actually accessible. I would like to, to render it accessible. If you are doing some experiments or expression, please don't hesitate, call me or, or contact me in order to use this system. Okay. And this system has also a mammalian cell version, but this is also very interesting because they can infect the mammalian cells uh, and get the same kind of expression. In, and infection is very robust in terms of expression. Uh, infection is, is great because you can infect all the cells. So in introspection, you have 80%, 60%, efficiency, and so on. And as Ian was telling, so this is happening at the FMB. Now we are only two in the group. Uh, I will be supported by a position for from ISERV and the laboratory is financed by the Active Learning Program and by the Foundation Metacurso. So uh, if you want to know something more about it, any question or if you just want to contact or whatever, so please do it uh, and, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Is for to know whether they are doing both at the same time or they are doing either one or the 
the other because I guess the strategy to tackle well, one. I think is that actually the differences are, are very, very, very small. Uh, our difference in the initiation. Mm. So, for uh, instance, in, in Bundabars or, or Flu, so they initiate differently. So one is initiating the capture machine and the other the mobile. But after that, it's the same. Okay. They just synthesize the RNA. And so there's another thing that some virus poly and then make the RNA, so there are more, compl more complications. But the synthesis, once it's treated, could be the same. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I agree. So in this, it shouldn't change. What is changing are these specific initiation and termination processes. Yeah. Yeah. But we have to figure it out. Okay, a very naive question. Do you have peptides in, in the segmented uh, RNA virus that are overlapping one segment to another? You put your virus. In segmented virus. In mm -hmm. the segment of the well, actually, actually uh, these libraries. Yeah. Uh, Maybe, yeah, I don't know if for the full polymer it's very long. So, but I don't know, I have no access to one. Why? No, I, I, I wonder why if they get the segmented RNA. Uh, 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 you know, it's looking like, uh, if you look at uh, <coughs> what I was thinking about, that you know, I think the eukaryotes, you can now you can see, see that there is different isoforms. Yes. And uh, I, my question is that can you get isoform by Ascending peptide overlapping different segments in different parts and making a, 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 a diversity protein yeah. much bigger than having a single uh, molecule. That, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Like, 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 yeah. Actually, if you compare, uh, if you compare the different polymerases, because uh, yeah, in, in humans we have isopher, but in viral we have the species. So when you have these big changes, so there is another species normal, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you compare between the well, maybe I'm doing a very vast comparison, but uh, if you look at different experiences, uh, not isoforms, because uh, the virus. Yes, so, so you can see this in serial time. For, for long, we, we did not understand why we get these introns, you know. And now we, we just start to understand that the, the, the why introns are useful is that because you can get isoforms, these forms. That yeah. makes you get much, much more protein that if you don't get it. Yeah. And uh, um, so my, my, my suggestion is that if you get the equivalent, if I get segmented uh, genome, you may have a rearrangement uh, to get that type of overlapping from one to the other one, like you get with the exit. In the case of Mundia virus, uh, no, because you are really touching different proteins. You don't have the same protein or a complex mixer, but a complex that is meant by two subunits that are in different segments. This happens in influenza. So you have one segment for each of the polymerase. Mm -hmm. And actually this is very nice because you sometimes have reassorting. Uh -huh. So two different viruses are infecting the same cell and they change information. Uh -huh. And this is making a new gamma well, This is actually what happened with the new flu each year, normally are reassorting. The so they have this ability. Sometimes are compatible, sometimes are not. Yeah, but this is a source of diversity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I got another question. So what is the protein similarity? In terms of, I mean, I see, I less than twenty percent or twenty, yeah, none. You know, uh, you take two random proteins and you get kind of fifteen percent or something. I mean, twenty percent strength of influenza. Well, it's more, it's more. Then you, you maybe you are in sixty, fifty, depending on the different strengths. But you can go even below one. So my question is, even that the domains are very well observed. Yes. Which is the adaptation that might have the mutations that make the difference between different proteins? My point is that you need to conserve the, the domain, yeah. but you still have differences. These yeah. differences are just because they don't affect at all the function, function of the protein or they have an adaptive function. They, they have, uh, I, I guess, probably you can find both. So, what we have found, for instance, uh, this is a very funny conception here, which is actually, you would say, well, it's, it's, it's irrelevant. Uh, so here, uh, California insertion. Okay, this California insertion is an insertion that only has one group of virus of this uh, orphan member. So it's very specific. If you remove it, the virus is not active. So yes, it's an adaptive uh, adaptation. It's an adaptation that is essential for these viruses. Whatever, but we don't know why. 
pudra de y esta se puede ser pudra de pudra de mutation para transformar no es de RNA y de genome de the virus es de context de several context of the host por el driving pudra de mutation que es selectivo no cuál es la selección selection and at the end depending on the circumstances one selected or the other is selected and these viruses are already sold <coughs> for parts. So you have a uh, yeah in an infection you can have I don't know how many rounds or, or but maybe you can have uh, a depending on the infection 10 or 20 rounds, 20 generations of viruses and uh, that they mix that they recombine that they <laughs> so it is a broad a very big this is a, one of the adapted solutions of these viruses that they have amazing capability of uh, proposing different solutions by recombining, mutating and so on and at the end one of these uh, uh, solutions prevails and that's a scary thing as well for instance now in the fact we have the, the climate change and the redistribution of population and uh, this part sometimes we find solutions you change the environment you just find the solution and maybe the solution could be you mm -hmm. this is an interesting environment uh, for RNA virus that they will take very very yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, I wonder, I mean, what way it's driving? I mean, of course, all the days, and the other stations select some of the variants, but I wonder which are the adaptive uh, mutations. Uh, there are some that are random, and they just get selected because it's yeah, like exactly. natural selection. Let me find what for is important this mutation. This is what you mean. Yes. So, the, what, what, what is insertion? For instance, no? Yeah. So, and here we came to the to the biological part. So the, the right thing would be to really actually characterize why when we remove the, what is affected when we remove yeah. the mutation. So and then we can propose why this is important. So I think this 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 is uh, important for you remember when the coupling when when the replication was coming out the RNA molecule and then a new RNA was synthesized. I have a feeling by uh, the microscopy data that this is the case where this, uh, the, 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 the protein that is working and the protein that is accepting needs some complementation. Mm -hmm. And this complementation sometimes is excluding other viruses, similar viruses, to, to get in. And uh, it's, it's, it's given specificity for the virus system, for the my own, for one of the viruses to get into my system. Uh, this, this can be a reason why this little anomaly, we say, or able for insertions or conditions. But I don't have the result to to the okay. So on the, in terms of the initial, do you think this might be so that the interesting sites? Yeah, in terms of inhibitor generation. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, for instance, what would happen if uh, you find a compound that is able to block the five prime of the side. Mm -hmm. So the protein would be constitutively active or constitutively inactive. So this year is the break of the main regulatory process. Another thing that we can try is to compete with RNA, uh, the binding side for the free prime RNA. What would happen there? The polymer it wouldn't recognize its own RNA. It would be random looking for something and, and finding nothing. So this would be another mechanism of, uh, of inhibition. And then you have the active side, a 2.7 right, a so resolution with different. Then there is another feature like uh, the endonuclease, for instance. You can target the endonuclease. I mean, there are plenty, so I could I, I couldn't do all them, no. But, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe the RNA would be very interesting to test because the RNA, uh, the five prime RNA, is is very is very common to you know to find broad spectra inhibitors. It's very common to all these viruses. So maybe if we can find something that is blocking all them. Uh, would be very nice. Yes. I want to probably <coughs> test those for you if you want to catch them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have to do that. No? Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.